for decades, we've been acting under the illusion that we could empower black people by sending other black people as elected officials uh, to the city councils and to the legislatures and finally uh, to the White House itself, uh, only to find out that their philosophy of politics was all power to those who already had power. All power to the banks, all power to the real estate developers, all power to the plutocrats, and all power to the Pentagon. That is what has become of our black power. All power to a president who uses his power to send $16 trillion to Wall Street, and not just the banks on Wall Street, but banks in France, and in Great Britain, and in Switzerland, and in Belgium. But he sent not a dime to Harlem, or to all the other Harlems of the country to rescue us uh, from the mess that Wall Street made. There does come a time of awakening, and we know that we are now in that time, although some black folks are still trying to act like they're sleeping. The young people that began this occupation movement less than two months ago are not us, but they have done all of us a great service because they have shouted out the name and the address of the enemy of all mankind. The name is finance capital and the address is Wall Street. And that is a statement of utmost clarity. There's nothing, there's nothing misleading, there's nothing confusion about this. It is the truth. But there are some among us who are trying to, to uh, confuse our folks about this essential and central truth. And we have been done more damage to by Wall Street than any other group in this country. It is our obligation to speak, and to speak now, and we've got to meet that obligation. We owe that to our ancestors. And I'm speaking, I'm thinking specifically about Frederick Douglass. Uh, in 1847, uh, he published the first issue of his new newspaper. It was called The North Star. And Douglas was a star of the mostly white-led abolition movement. The white abolitionists already had a newspaper. It was called The Liberator, and it was run by a person called William Lloyd Garrison. He was a friend of Frederick Douglass, and he was often a political ally within the abolitionist movement. So many of the white abolitionists were upset. They wondered, why did Frederick Douglass, who was only about 29 years old at the time, why did Douglass think that it was necessary for him to set up his own black newspaper? And Douglass answered that question, and he answered it on the masthead of the first issue of his paper. He wrote, the man who has suffered the wrong is the man to demand redress. The man who is struck is the man to cry out. It was the slave and his nominally free brothers and sisters who were the primary victims of the slave system. Therefore, they must be the first and the loudest to cry out about the slave system. They needed their own newspaper and they needed their own black abolition movement. Frederick Douglass didn't split with the white abolitionists. Instead, he created a focus, uh, a kind of center for mobilizing free black people and enslaved black people to speak in their own voices for their own freedom as defined by themselves. But he also remained the closest of comrades with every white, honest abolitionist that fought for the cause, or, for, or, for, or who died for the cause, like John Brown did. If Frederick Douglass were alive today, he would look out over the political scene and he would declare that black people should be the first to cry out against the rule of Wall Street, against the rule of finance capital. The foreclosure crisis 
had already wiped out many homeowners in the black community by the year 2005. That was two years before the problem became general enough to be recognized as a national crisis. We were the first victims of Wall Street's housing crimes, but our leaders did not cry out. Certainly they didn't cry out loud enough for to make, it, for to make any difference. And because of that, the black household wealth crisis had already begun well before the meltdown of the autumn of 2008. Some of you should remember that candidate Barack Obama took the most pro-Wall Street position of all the Democratic candidates early in 2008. John Edwards was calling for a mandatory moratorium on home foreclosure. Hillary Clinton wanted a toothless, but at least voluntary moratorium. But Barack Obama opposed any moratorium on foreclosures. He said that the markets ought to be left free to work this out on their own. In other words, let Wall Street police itself. He was working for Wall Street then, and he didn't even have the job, and yet he was working for them. Just like Bill Clinton worked for Wall Street, black people were the first to be struck by Clinton's policies. His NAFTA stole what was left of our good manufacturing jobs. His welfare reform fell disproportionately on us, and he imprisoned more people than any other president. And when he left the White House, he made sure that the Glass-Steagall Act, which had been in place since the Great Depression, was repealed. Bill Clinton set the stage for the Great Recession and for the economic destruction of black America. But we did not cry out. And when his political twin, Barack Obama, entered the White House with the same Clinton Wall Street crew, we didn't cry. We didn't cry out, but we did cry with tears of joy. And Obama couldn't wait even until he got into the White House before announcing, and this was two weeks before he took the oath of office, that he would be putting Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and every other program of the New Deal and the Great Society on the chopping block to be dismembered. And we didn't cry out then either. And we allowed him to do his dance with the Republicans for almost three years as our communities were crumbling around us and as we were being gentrified out of our communities. And now, some white kids are pointing the finger at Obama's masters. They're saying that Wall Street is the problem, that Wall Street controls the entire political system, including Obama and his White House, including Charlie Rangel and all his fat benefactors, including most of the traditional black organizations who get their contributions straight from Wall Street, and including much of the black misleadership class. They are all bought and paid for by Wall Street. But we still have some among us who say, what are those white kids talking about? They're talking about the dictatorship of Wall Street. And the question is, what are we talking about? Don't worry about whether they, I'm talking about the kids downtown, have our interests in mind. What do we have in mind is the question. What are we going to do about the power of Wall Street? What are we going to do, just vote for Obama? Obama is not thinking about black people because he thinks he has us in his pocket. What he's thinking about is how he's going to get that $1 billion in campaign contributions from the same finance capitalists that his government gave $16 trillion to since coming into office. And he will get it because that was the deal, and the deal is a deal. And black people are not part of that deal because we did not cry out. It's way past time for any deals. 
no wheeling and no dealing can save this system. The people's job is to save themselves, and that can only happen by organizing for our own economic and political defense. And I see a whole bunch of organizers right here. So we have to make some decisions at this momentous time in history. We can seize this time at this momentous period in history, or we can diddle and we can quibble about what's going on in other people's minds and what other people's motivations are. But whatever we do and whatever we don't do, this system is on its way to collapse. And that is inevitable, and it's sooner than you think. Now, I like to think of it like an old car. Uh, the transmission is gone, and the wiring is short, and the engine is about to blow around. And we know that that car is going to stop, stop. And when it stops, it's not going to start up again. But it's really worse than that analogy to the old car that is inevitably going to stop. Because this car has a bomb in it. And the bomb is called derivatives. When the meltdown occurred in September of 2008, there were derivatives hovering over the world economy that were valued at between 600 and 1,000 trillion dollars. And the world economy is only 75 trillion dollars a year. Today, under Obama, and with all of his bragging about that phony financial reform, there are still six hundred trillion dollars of derivatives looming over us, which proves there wasn't any reform at all, and the bomb is still ticking. 